let's face it, humans stink. And I mean that in the most literal way. That's not always a bad thing. We use smells to interact with each other and navigate our lives. But from our first breath to our last breath, we produce odors. And we smell the odors produced by the people around us. But we don't have just one smell for our entire lives. I don't have one unique Hank smell because my smell changes as I go through my life and get older. I will have many Hank smells throughout my life. So let's walk through our life in smells. We'll start off with baby smells, because if you've been around a human baby, you know that it's not all poopy diapers. They're fresh, lovely even. But why is that? If you've been around a newborn baby, you might have noticed that they smell just good. For a while, lots of people thought this mild, pleasant scent was just baby powder or sweet-smelling wipes. Others claimed it was just a myth, a hallucination by sleep-deprived new parents. But just like new house smell and new car smell, new baby smell is real. But what exactly causes this special scent, and why do scientists think it might be an evolutionary benefit for mothers and their babies? Our body odors are made of lots of different secreted chemicals, but it's hard to figure out how each one contributes to our natural smells. And newborn baby smell is extra hard to study because the scent is usually gone after about six weeks. Researchers think one factor could be leftover amniotic fluid, which is the protective substance that surrounds the embryo as it grows. Plus, there might be traces of vernix caseosa, a whitish layer of waxy oils and cells that coats babies' skin when they're born. But even though we don't know exactly what causes this scent, scientists want to understand why it exists. A 2013 study published in the journal Frontiers in Psychology found evidence that suggests this scent may affect certain brain regions of all women, but especially new mothers. Others. To test this, they rounded up a group of 30 women that were about the same age, 15 who had given birth within the previous six weeks, and 15 who had never given birth. The researchers isolated baby smell from baby pajamas, specifically from 18 newborns that weren't related to any of the participants. Then they had the women smell the newborn odors while undergoing brain scans. All of the women showed activity in the reward-related areas of the brain. There was slightly more brain activity in new moms. Basically, the researchers think that the smell might act as a sort of incentive to get the new moms to feel pleasure when they take care of babies. This could promote more maternal care and offset some of the exhaustion and hard work of parenting. But what about new dads? Are they affected by this baby smell too? Well, we still have a lot to learn about the smell of newborn babies. And there haven't been any studies involving men yet, although researchers think the effects of baby smell might be similar. So babies have evolved a way to distract parents from the smells of everything that's constantly coming out of the baby. Which makes sense, because they need us to like them and take care of them at that stage in life. They can't go anywhere unless we take them. So then what about the next stage in life, when we start walking around and soaking up as many new environments and experiences as possible? Let's talk about your childhood smells, or at least what you remember of them. You're walking through a hardware store one day when all of a sudden you catch a whiff something you haven't smelled in years. Somehow, the scent of glue immediately takes you back to your kindergarten classroom, and you spend the next couple of minutes wondering what happened to that kid who used to eat all that paste. You just experience what's known as odor-evoked autobiographical memory. To put it simply, a smell made you remember something from your past, and it happened because of the way smells and memories are hardwired into your brain. Now, lots of different cues, like sights or sounds, or even someone describing something or telling a story unrelated to your story, they can trigger memories. But memories linked to smells are often stronger and more vivid, and studies have shown that they also tend to be memories of your early life, often before you were 10 years old. Which is weird, because adults usually experience what's known as a reminiscence bump, where they don't remember much from before their adolescence. But smells are really good at bringing those memories back. These memories tend to be more perceptual rather than conceptual, so you remember a particular sensation rather than a bunch of facts about something that happened. And researchers have come up with some theories why memories triggered by smells are so odd. There's a big difference between the way your body handles sight, sound, taste, and touch, and the way it processes smells. Those other senses are all routed through the thalamus, the part of your brain that sends them off into the appropriate processing centers. But smells bypass all that. Once they're detected by receptors in your nose, the signal heads straight to your olfactory bulb, the smell-analyzing region in your brain. And that area happens to be connected to the amygdala and the hippocampus, which are parts of the brain that help handle memory and emotion. So it's possible that when you smelled that glue in kindergarten, the signal got tangled up with with memories of building blocks and apple juice. And when you smelled it again, later, you remembered not just the glue, but also some of the associated memories, like that weird kid who ate the paste. In 2013, a group of European psychologists tested this whole phenomenon using functional magnetic resonance imaging. First, they presented subjects with 20 different strong, specific odors, like garlic, whiskey, and leather. Then, for each person, they identified the two that elicited the oldest positive memories. 
subjects. Then it was time to scan their brains. Each subject was presented with their two experimental smells, plus two generic control smells, flowers and citrus. They were also shown some verbal cues, which were just the names of the smells projected onto a screen. The researchers found that both types of triggers tended to activate the regions of the brain associated with memory. But while the verbal cues lit up parts of the brain that were responsible for processing smells, the smells themselves were more strongly connected to emotional processing centers. Some of the participants associated the smells with memories from before they were 10, while others remembered things from when they were between 10 and 20. And depending on which time frame the memories fell into, their brains tended to use different regions to recall them. The earlier memories lit up the orbitofrontal cortex, which is connected to perception. The later ones, on the other hand, tended to activate the left inferior frontal gyrus, which handles more conceptual memories. So, can you use your nose's superpowers to help you remember things for your next big exam? Probably not. Smells tend to evoke early perceptive memories of events, not concepts. So the scent of glue might make you remember playing with construction paper in kindergarten, but your smell memory will not help you memorize Maxwell's equations. You gotta wonder why they chose the smell of leather for these tests. Did these researchers grow up in an old library with leather-bound books and big squishy chairs? Cause to me those smells are like the grown-up smells, but their smell associations I guess are different from mine. And in the realm of grown-up smells, some animals have pheromones to help them find a mate. Now I'm guessing though that you'd be hard pressed to place the smell of human mating pheromones, but is it possible that we have them anyway? In the late 19th century, American entomologist Joseph Lintner discovered a small army of male silk moths crowding a female outside his window. This was not something Lintner was used to seeing, and he guessed that the frenzy of male attention had to do with some kind of chemical perfume the female was emitting. He was right, and although there wasn't a name for it yet, Lintner was watching the actions of pheromones, chemical signals that help some species communicate. Since then, scientists have found that lots of living things, especially social insects, use pheromones to some degree. But there's at least one species that continues to puzzle pheromone researchers, humans. I don't want to dash anyone's hopes of chemically attracting a valentine this year, but I'm just gonna put this out there. So far, no one has definitively identified a human pheromone. Though that hasn't stopped loads of companies from marketing so-called pheromone perfumes. Pheromones are made of all kinds of molecules, and they're usually detected by smell. Depending on the species, they might travel through air or water, or just be deposited straight onto the recipient. The goal is to prompt some kind of behavioral or psychological reaction. From observing dogs in heat to angry swarms of bees, humans have long suspected that animals were capable of quite quietly communicating certain messages like, hey, let's mate, or help, I'm dying, or danger, danger. But it wasn't until 1959 that technology finally allowed Nobel-winning German chemist Adolf Boutinant and his associates to separate and chemically identify the first official pheromone called Bombicol, which was released by female silkworm moths to attract mates. Boutinant and his crew showed that exposure to a mature lady moth induced a particular behavior in a receiving male moth, in this case, a whole lot of excited wing fluttering. They then then isolated and then synthesized Bombicol molecules and showed that they had exactly the same effect on males. That's more or less how new pheromones are identified today, by pinpointing specific behaviors and then nailing down the exact molecules causing them. But before we get into whether humans might have them, and whether it even matters, let's talk about how they work in other animals, and even plants. We tend to think of pheromones as aphrodisiacs, but the truth is different species actually use them to silently communicate all sorts of different things. Though yeah, a lot of them do boil down to sex. like the androstenone in boar saliva that makes fertile sows assume the mating position when they catch a whiff. But other pheromones induce aggression or alarm, advertise territorial boundaries, promote parent-offspring bonding, or just generally keep social behaviors in check. Pheromones fall into two broad categories. Releaser pheromones are fast-acting and produce short-term behavioral changes, like repelling or attracting other individuals. Primer pheromones, on the other hand, work at a slower pace and cause longer-lasting hormonal changes in behavior or development. But while pheromones are supposed to aid in communication within a species, sometimes they can backfire and draw the attention of a different species. If this attention damages the signaling animal in some way, say by attracting predators or warning prey, that chemical is known as a chiromone. This might happen, for instance, when army ants, a highly social species, lay down a pheromone chemical trail so that wandering ants can find their way home. But sometimes that chemical trail also attracts a snake and leads it right to their door. Other chiromones seem to alert prey to the presence of predators, causing them to scatter or prepare to defend themselves. And other times, one species might actually mimic 
another species' pheromones in a kind of deadly romantic trickery, the way that female American bolus spiders imitate the love scent of a certain kind of moth to lure randy males into their sticky, ball-like webs. Some plants use this kind of deception, too. Not only do some orchid flowers look like bees, but they're also able to mimic female bee sex pheromones to attract males. Then, as the males try to get it on with the flowers, they inadvertently pick up and transport pollen, which is something we humans can use to our advantage. For years, entomologists have used pheromones to control agricultural pest insects. For example, releasing synthetic female hormones of certain moth species can confuse males and disrupt the mating process, which helps control the population. Pheromones may even help save human lives. Some researchers are looking at using these signaling chemicals to disrupt the life cycle of a nasty little parasitic nematode that spreads disease in humans and other species. So pheromones may help us humans protect our crops or fight parasites, and yeah, that's all pretty cool, but by now, you're probably wondering, if they can affect other animals so much, can pheromones score you a date? Well, no, probably not, but to be honest, we're not 100% sure. Turns out the idea of human pheromones is a very tricky business. It's likely that we do have pheromones, just because we're related to so many other mammals that do. But remember, no one has specifically identified a human pheromone molecule. There are a few well-known studies that seem to suggest that we have them, like a famous 1994 t-shirt sniffing experiment that suggested women prefer the scent of men with different immune system genetics than their own. There have also been lab trials involving androstenone, that male pig pheromone that we just talked about makes the lady pigs go wild, and also happens to be found in human sweat. But these kinds of studies have had lots of problems. They often involve small sample sizes, poor experimental design, or just results that can't be replicated. In fact, some researchers think that the field of human pheromone work has become so controversial, even sensational, that we should scrap all the past studies and basically start over from scratch. And there's another problem with all this. We might not even have the right parts to detect pheromones in the first place. All vertebrates have a main olfactory system in some form of a nose, but many animals, including snakes, lizards, and rodents, also possess a special extra-sniffing organ called the vomeronasal organ, or VNO, that they use to detect pheromones. But humans probably don't have one, at least not one that works. We might start out with a VNO as fetuses, but most biologists agree that it disappears during fetal development. And even though some adults seem to have a kind of leftover vomeronasal cavity, it doesn't have sensory neurons and probably doesn't work. Still, in other animals, both kinds of sniffers ultimately send their signals to the same place, the amygdala, a major memory and motivation hub in the brain. And in animals that do have a VNO, we see a lot of overlap in pheromone and smell inputs. And some species actually do use their main noses to detect pheromones, so just because we humans and other primates don't have a functional VNO doesn't mean that we don't have pheromones. We certainly do send some messages via smell, like human newborns know the scent of their mother's breasts from across the room, humans and other mammals give off a pig pen-style cloud of personal molecules that give us unique scent profiles, which is why you might be able to tell who someone is just by their smell. But smells aren't the same thing as pheromones. Still, even if they aren't technically pheromones, these smells might act in a similar way by influencing our mating choices. A particular blend of things like secretions, bacteria, immune system genetics, food particles might make you more or less attractive to me. But the attractiveness of body odor also involves a lot of nuance, and how we feel about a smell often depends on our previous experiences with it. That's because the receptor cells in our nasal cavities shoot information to our brain's main olfactory bulb, which relays it to the parts of the limbic system right next to the memory-making hippocampus and the emotion-inducing amygdala. Which means scent is also rooted in memory. You might suddenly feel happy when you smell pancakes because that's what your family made on lazy Sunday mornings growing up, or feel attracted to the scent of sweat and sawdust because your sweetheart is a sexy lumberjack. In other words, we often respond to scents because of their context, not necessarily because of something about the molecules they're made of. Which is what makes them different from pheromones, when it is all about the molecules. Plus, humans are all about conscious choice. Like, I don't care if you smell like the best thing on Earth, if I watch you kick a kitten, I'm not gonna feel any attraction to you. And losing my sense of smell? It would suck, but unlike for some animals that use pheromones, it wouldn't exactly destroy my life cycle or limit my social behavior too much. I would still have control over my choices. So if pheromones do influence our behavior, the effects are likely much more subtle. This fact, combined with the knowledge that humans are also greatly influenced by sight, sound, memory, learning, context, and social norms, is yet another reason why the potential existence 
existence and influence of human pheromones remains a bit of a mystery. So what's the next step in figuring out if we have them? Well, so far most human pheromone work has focused on the sex end of things, but as you might have noticed, humans are really complicated, especially adult humans. That's why French researchers are looking instead at babies and how chemicals secreted by nursing mothers affect sucking and mouth motion behavior in newborns. If a molecule from that secretion can be identified, synthesized, and shown to induce sucking and rooting behavior in any baby, then we might have our first official human pheromone. Either way, in the end, if you're looking to attract a date, I'd save money on anything marked as a pheromone boost and just work on polishing up your conversation skills. So they still don't know if we have pheromones. But as you age, they say that chemical attraction starts to take a backseat to the intellectual companionship that a partner brings anyway. Which is good, because as we age, our bodies start making some completely new chemicals that smell pretty distinct. Now remember, getting older doesn't have to stink. I mean, it's always going to give off a certain smell, but that isn't necessarily a bad smell. It's just a very identifiable old smell. So Stefan is here to tell you all about old people smell. If you got to spend time with your family back during the holidays, you might have noticed that Grandpa smells a little old. Not stinky or bad, he just had that distinctive old person smell, which some people describe as grassy or greasy. And you weren't imagining it either. Like baby humans, older humans do have a certain odor, and it's likely caused by the chemical nonenol. More specifically, that smell is caused by a version of the molecule called 2-nonenol, and it occurs naturally on human skin. Researchers have found that nonenol begins appearing around age 40, and that the amount of it increases as you age. It all has to do with the complex chemistry in your skin. See, your skin secretes fats to help form a barrier between your body and everything in the outside world. It helps keep moisture in and bad things out. And these fats are found in the outer layer of your skin, the stratum corneum. Now when those fats are exposed to oxygen in the air, they start to break down and form other chemicals, also known as being oxidized. But your body kind of needs those fats. So to help prevent this, your skin also produces antioxidants. But as you age, two things happen. One is that your skin produces fewer antioxidants, so more fats get oxidized, and the other is that the types of fats your skin secretes also changes, which might have to do with how your hormones change over time. And when those new fats get oxidized, that creates nonenol. As you get older, your skin produces more of these specific fats and fewer antioxidants. So you get more nonenol and more old people smell. So what can you do about it? Not much. Nonenol isn't water soluble, which means it won't dissolve in water and it's hard to wash off. Soap can remove non-water soluble substances, but it doesn't remove all the fats from your skin. If it did, your skin would be really dry and uncomfortable, which means that even after bathing, some nonenol is still left on your body. And while many commercial soaps contain deodorants to combat other bodily odors, most don't yet contain deodorants targeted for nonenol. So smelling like it does not indicate poor hygiene. Whether or not you like the smell probably depends on your personal experiences, your culture, and how you feel about getting older. But by itself, the smell is a totally normal part of aging. In fact, in a blind sniff test, the body odor of people over age 75 was described as neutral and rated as less unpleasant than that of young or middle-aged people. And in general, you might even consider non-enol as the smell of a survivor, of experience, or of the most interesting people in the world. I believe Stefan just said that 40 is when people start making old people smell? I... I'm not comfortable with this. I probably shouldn't be too surprised because there's a lot in this world that we can smell. We just don't usually give ourselves enough credit for our human smelling capabilities. They're pretty impressive. So to wrap this all up, let's show some appreciation for all that our noses know. You've probably heard that lots of mammals besides humans have incredible senses of smell, like how dogs use their noses to track down food or communicate with each other or find drugs. But think about it. The smell of your mom's cooking or your childhood home sometimes sets off powerful memories, doesn't it? And you can tell right away if food goes bad. A review published last week in the journal Science argues that humans do stack up to other mammals in the smell department, although we detect different scents for different reasons. So why do we think? Our noses suck! Well, this researcher suggests that it's because of misconceptions that started with a 19th century neuroanatomist named Paul Broca. Your ability to smell comes from two ovals of tissue tucked under the frontal lobe called the olfactory bulbs, which receive smell information and send it off to the rest of your brain for interpretation. In many mammals, like dogs, these bulbs sit right at the front of the skull and are 
big compared to the rest of their brains. In mice, for instance, they make up about 2% of the total brain volume. But in humans and other primates, they're kind of pushed out of the way, and they're small by comparison. They only account for about 0.01% of your brain volume. So while investigating the anatomy of the frontal lobe, Paul Broca thought that our relatively tiny bulbs meant that our behaviors are guided by other brain regions and thought processes instead of smell, like many other mammals. This recent review suggests that, like a game of historical telephone, this idea got passed around until a general scientific understanding was that humans have a bad sense of smell. But turns out it may not be that simple, according to experimental data. In some studies, scientists compared the number of neurons in olfactory bulbs of lots of mammals, because we think information processing has to do with the number of neurons and connections between them, not just brain size. And humans were right up there with animals like mice and rats and monkeys. Other studies showed that humans are just as good at or better than other mammals at detecting tiny amounts of certain scents, like some sulfur-containing compounds or the smell of bananas, but we're also worse than mice or dogs or rabbits when it comes to other odors. One 2007 paper in Nature Neuroscience even found that humans can follow scent trails just like dogs. They compared a dog following a trail of a pheasant dragged through a field to a human sniffing for chocolate essential oil, and their paths were similar. This is a hilarious thought to me that there's just a guy sniffing through a field after chocolate smell. But even with all this research, the review suggests that we still have a lot to learn. It can be hard to compare our sense of smell with other mammals because we experience scents differently. Like, we don't go around sniffing each other's butts because we have other ways of communicating. Basically, smell is definitely part of our social makeup and things like memory, but I don't think that we're gonna see, like, luggage-sniffing humans at airports anytime soon. We definitely benefit from our incredible sense of smell at every stage of life. It helps us convince our parents to take care of us, partners to reproduce with us, and generally continue the species. And whether it's sniffing out the truth behind human pheromones or comparing our odor processing to other animals, SciShow is here for all of your aromatic asks. If you like this video, you might also like our video on the smells of outer space. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.